Hi, welcome to my first lecture. My name is Diaz Amanov, a second year medical student at Shanghai Medical College Wudan University. And today we'll be doing general principles. So there are many sections in my physiology lectures. So there's general principles, also known as basic cell functions. Then there's cardiology, pulmonology, nephrology, endocrinology, gastroenterology, and etc. So today we'll be doing the first lecture of general principles, which is cell transport. I believe there are four lectures in general principle. So let's get started. So whatever notes I make in this lecture, I'll be posting it in a Google Drive folder. And the link for that folder, I'll be posting it in either this, the description or the comments section of this video. So let's get started with cell membrane. Now we know that the cell membrane has something called phospholipids. So these are the phospholipids. Each phospholipid adds two parts. The first one is the hydrophilic head. And the second part is the two hydrophobic tails. What's the difference between hydrophilic and hydrophobic? Hydrophilic is water loving and hydrophobic is water hating. So this means that since both of them are part of the same or part of one phospholipid, it must be arranged in a way so that they can accommodate both of these sections. So we know that they're arranged in something called a phospholipid bilayer. And this phospholipid bilayer, we could see that the tails, they face each other and the heads, they face outwards. Or we could say in this example here, this hydrophilic head, they face the inside of the cell and this head, they face outside of the cell because inside and outside the water, they have water soluble substances, right? Because they're hydrophilic, so they can face that area. However, the hydrophobic tails, they're water hating, meaning they have to face each other to accommodate themselves. Now, let's say that this is the outside of the cell and this is the inside of the cell. There are some substances which is directly passed through the phospholipid bilayer and they pass through by a transport system called simple diffusion. We'll discuss that later in this lecture. And there's other ways where they use proteins or carrier proteins or channel proteins. So the ones that can directly pass through the phospholipid bilayer, they're known as lipid soluble substances. And there are several lipid soluble substances. There are steroids, then there are hormones, then there are, of course, lipids themselves. Then we have gases such as O2, CO2, and N2. And we have numerous drugs and anesthetic gases. Now, why can these lipid soluble substances pass through directly again by simple diffusion? It's because lipids are non-polar. So we could write that lipids are non-polar here which means they can, the hydrophobic tails, the hydrophobic tails here can accommodate these non-polar substances. They can easily pass through them. Now, let's see what about other molecules, such as water-soluble molecules. So we have many examples here. We have glucose, we have H2O here, which is water. We have chl a chloride ion, which is a charged particle, and we have a sodium ion. So how do these pass through the lipid bilayer? So we could say that these are water-soluble substances. And they pass through something called a carrier protein or a channel protein. Why can't these water-soluble substances directly pass through the lipid bilayer? We know that the, they are hydrophobic tails in the lipid bilayer. So they're water-hating. So water-soluble substances can't pass through them they'll repel them. All the molecules, such as if, look at this oxygen right here, there's a, a negative polar charge, this oxygen in the glucose. It will just bounce off when it tries to enter the lipid bilayer. Even the chloride ion, it'll just bounce off. The sodium ion, it'll just bounce off. So it, it can't pass through the lipid bilayer by, by means of simple diffusion directly through the bilayer. It has to use a carrier protein. And there are many, channels and carrier proteins where these molecules can pass through and those are known as carrier mediated transport 
and there are many examples such as facilitated diffusion, this primary active transport and secondary active transport. So molecules which are repelled by the lipid bilayer, we could say are charged molecules such as H2O, Na+, chloride ion, K+, and glucose. And the second type of molecules or particles are large particles such as proteins. So we have talked about how lipid soluble substances such as steroid, hormones, lipids, O2, CO2, N2 drugs, and anesthetic gases pass through the cell membrane, which is simply by simple diffusion, because they are lipid soluble or they are non-polar, so they can pass through the hydrophobic two tails. And we also have talked about how water soluble substances pass through. They pass through to channel or carrier proteins. So now let's talk about simple diffusion, how, how they pass through and what are the characteristics of simple diffusion. So for simple diffusion, obviously it just passes through the membrane, right? So we could say that the first thing is that there is no carrier or channel protein required. Secondly, since it's just from one side of the, from outside of the cell to inside of the cell, it does not require any, any, any energy All is also known as passive transport. So no ATP is required. So we could write no ATP is required or it's passive transport. And the third characteristic is that it flows from high to low concentration gradient or it follows the concentration gradient. So these are the characteristics of simple diffusion. It's for lipid soluble diffusion. Um, or lipid soluble substances, excuse me. So those are steroids, hormones, gases like CO2, O2. And one example that you could give is where it's um, gas exchange in the alveoli in the lungs. That's why simple diffusion. Now let's move on to the second type of molecules that pass through the phospholipid bilayer, which is the water soluble molecules or molecules which are too large. The example which I forgot to mention was molecules which are too large. Even though they may be nonpolar, they're just too large to fit in between the phospholipid bilayer. So all the, all the hydrophilic heads, they're just too large to fit in. So they go through a transport system called carrier or channel mediated transport. So let's look at that now. So you could see in this example, there is a uh, an example given of Na plus going into the cell, which is the cystal, that's the cytoplasm, and K plus ions going out of the cell to the extracellular matrix. This is just an example. We'll go through that very soon. But let's first give the characteristics of a carrier or channel mediated transport. So the first one is obviously that it has a carrier or channel protein. Second, there are many different types of carrier or channel mediated transport such as facilitated diffusion or primary active transport or secondary active transport facilitated diffusion is diffusion so it does not require atp but active transport they require atp so we won't write if they require atp or not because it's too the, the topic which is carrier mediated transport is too vague to write atp or not atp so instead of that there's another characteristic known as it can be saturated. So since there are a certain number of molecules that should pass through these channels or um, carrier proteins, it can be saturated if there's too much of that molecule. So it can reach something called as a transport maximum. And we're going to write this transport maximum word in a short form called TM. Since it can be saturated and since it can reach a transport maximum, meaning once there's too much or too many of that molecules around that channel or that carrier protein, it can experience competition. So the transport efficiency or the transport speed will actually decrease and it will basically, as it says, becomes saturated or becomes stagnant. So there are three types of carrier or channel mediated transport, which are facilitated diffusion, 
primary active transport and secondary active transport. So the first one is facilitated diffusion. And the second and third are primary and secondary active transport. First, let's go through facilitated diffusion and its characteristics. So, as I said, for facilitated diffusion, since it's diffusion, there's actually no need for ATP. It's passive. So we could first write that it has no energy required or it's a passive transport system. Second, it requires a protein. It can either be a channel protein or a carrier protein. There are different and I'll explain the difference between a channel or a carrier protein. So for a channel protein, as the internet says, it is a type of transport protein that acts like a pore in the membrane that lets water molecules or small ions that pass through. And one example that I can remember is aquaporin in, um, in my high school, basically. So aquaporins are channels, channel proteins where it allows water to pass through the fossil repiler since it's water, right? So it's it can't pass through the hydrophobic tails. So the example for channel is aquaporins. And for carrier protein, it's a little bit different from the channel protein. For carrier protein, it's for a specific ion or a molecule or a group of molecules. So for channel, it can just directly pass through by diffusion such as water or very, very small ions. But for carrier, it's for specific ions or specific molecules or a group of molecules. And obviously, since it's diffusion, and like any other diffusion, even simple diffusion, it follows the concentration gradient from high to low concentration. Or we could just write follows gradient. Lastly, we can come to a conclusion that molecules that can't pass through simple diffusion can't pass through via simple diffusion because it's either too large or it's um, hydrophilic. We could say that almost any other particle can pass through via facilitated diffusion. Okay, so almost any other substance that cannot enter via simple diffusion can use facilitated diffusion. Adding to this, there are many voltage gated channels or there are chemically gated ion channels. There's also ligand gated channels. So these channels I'll be discussing in another lecture called action potential, um, not in this lecture. So now let's move on to the second type of carrier mediated transport, which is primary active transport. Now for primary active transport, since this is a carrier mediated transport, it requires a carrier protein, right? Now, why is it considered as active transport? So by definition, I hope you know that active transport is the movement of particles or molecules or ions or whatever against its concentration gradient. So it requires ATP, right? So we could write the second is that it moves molecules or ions or substances against its concentration gradient. Hence, it requires ATP. That's why it's called an active transport. Whereas for facilitated diffusion or simple diffusion, it's from high to low concentration. So, you know, it doesn't require energy. It can easily flow through. For this, it requires ATP. Now, there are many examples of primary active transport such as the Na plus K plus pump or the H plus ATPS or the Ca2 plus ATPS. Uh, one of the examples that our professor, meaning my classmates who are watching other than the rest of the world, um, our professor mentioned about the Na plus K plus pump where the ratio is three is to two. I will show that right now. So you could see in this diagram, there is three sodium ions that is attached to this carrier protein. And there's an ATP, I'll zoom in. There's an ATP that attaches to this protein as well. And because of this ATP becoming or fossilizing into ADP, the protein changes its shape. So one of the things that I learned from another uh, teacher from YouTube is that 
whenever an ATP binds or attaches itself to a protein, it changes shape. So that's why here it changes shape. And three amino acids, sorry, three sodium ions from the intercellular fluid or from inside the cell, they the the protein opens up and it goes outside. So three sodium ions exits the cell. And then when the protein faces outside of the cell, the potassium ions, two potassium ions to be precise, attaches itself to the protein and and the there's a released phosphate, which again changes its shape and the two potassium ions can enter the cell. So that's why the ratio is three is to two. So we could write here that the ratio is three is to two. Another example, important example uh, for primary active transport is the H plus ATPase. And the final example for this is the CA2 plus ATPase. Now, let's talk about secondary active transport. So it's a little bit different from primary active transport, and maybe it could be a little bit difficult to understand, but let's see. So for secondary active transport, let's first take out the basics. Is it number three? Yeah, it's number three. Okay, so secondary active transport. So the basics, since we know it's a carrier mediated transport system, that means it requires a carrier protein. And since it's active transport, it requires ATP. But it is known as a secondary active transport because it requires ATP, but indirectly. The, the carrier protein that actually um, where the carrier protein that where secondary active transport takes place, it does not require ATP. It actually requires ATP indirectly. So let's see why it requires ATP indirectly. So I have this image ready. Let's not talk about symport and antiport first. We will come to that. And let's just imagine that this right here, I'll remove the antiport part. Let's just imagine that this was what we just discussed um, earlier regarding primary active transport, the Na plus K Na plus K plus pump. So we know that is the ratio is three to two, right? So sodium ions actually gets pumped out, and the three sodium ions gets pumped out. So that means that outside of the cell, the concentration of sodium ions actually increases, right? Which means it can flow back into the cell via diffusion right from high to low concentration because there are more sodium ions outside so there's a channel actually that the sodium ions can flow back to its from high to low concentration but this channel allows other molecules to pass through as well and it can be glucose hydrogen ions calcium ions and amino acids so let's just say that this channel sodium ions pass through it from high to low concentration while it's doing that at the same time other molecules also pass through this channel that's why this is known as secondary active transport because it requires atp from this primary active transport it requires it indirectly it requires that atp meaning if this didn't exist at all the primary active transport if this, if this Na plus K plus pump didn't exist at all, it wouldn't work, right? This channel wouldn't work because there, there won't be an abundance of sodium ions outside the cell. There won't be a lot of sodium ions without this pump. That's why for this channel to work or for this carrier protein to work, it requires ATP, but indirectly, which is from this primary active transport. That's why a secondary active transport system requires ATP, but indirectly. Now, what's the difference between symport and antiport? So symport means, as I said, this uh, carrier protein, while the sodium ions are coming back into the cell from high concentration, which is outside to low concentration, there are other molecules that passes through this carrier protein at the same time. Symport is when molecules, trans, uh, molecules transfer from outside to inside of the cell in the same direction as the sodium ions. So that can be glucose and amino acids. So, symport. The examples for symport is Na plus and glucose. And another example is Na plus and amino acids. 
Now, this could make sense because glucose and amino acids, they are um, products of respiration, right, from digestion. So we could say that the cell requires energy. So glucose and amino acids are required. So they can travel through the cell by secondary active transport. Now for antiports, example for antiports. Antiports, as I said, they travel along, they travel through the channel with the sodium ions, but in the opposite direction. So it goes actually in the opposite direction. And those examples are uh, H plus ions and Ca2 plus ions. So antiport is when molecules are traveling to the opposite of the sodium ions direction. And symport is when molecules are traveling in the same direction as the sodium ions. So yeah, that's why it's known as uh, secondary active transport. It does not require ATP. Um, the channel itself does not require ATP, but it indirectly requires ATP from the primary active transport or from anywhere else uh, where there's an, uh, there's, there will be an abundance of um, any type of ions outside the cell. So yeah, the example for antiports are Na plus H plus ions and Na plus Ca2 plus ions. So yeah, um, if you didn't understand, I tried my best to explain this, why it uh, requires ATP. Um, the channel does not require ATP, but why it still requires ATP, but actually indirectly. And symport is when uh, the molecules travel across the membrane in the same direction as the sodium ions. And antiport is when it travels across the membrane in the opposite direction of um, the sodium ions. So yeah, uh, without this primary active transport, it wouldn't really work because there will be no high concentration of sodium ions and it, will, it won't return back to the cell. Right? So, yeah, that's the difference between symport and antiport. Lastly, to end this lecture, there's something known as a receptor mediated endocytosis. So, let's write that down. So, what is the receptor mediated endocytosis? So, there are some proteins on a ligand that bind to proteins on the cell surface, and cell membranes form coated vesicles that is then in ingested. So, and an image here that we could look through. So we have ligands, which are basically particles with proteins, and they bind to a receptor. And because of this, it can form a coat. While endocytosis, it can form a coat around that vesicle. So this is a receptor-mediated endocytosis to the use of ligands. Now, there are many examples for this, and let's go through them. So first, let's write that there are proteins on ligands that binds to the proteins on the cell surface, and then cell membrane forms coated vesicles that is then ingested. So some very important examples for this is uh, iron in the serum or the transferrin iron complex. There's the LDL that stimulates the LDL receptor, and there's the EGF that stimulates EGF receptor. So these are the three main examples for this receptor-mediated endocytosis. So yeah, transferrin and ion complex, then there's the LDL and LDLR complex, and then there's the EGF and EGFR complex, or EGF receptor, R is the receptor. So that is done for today's lecture. Um, this is the cell transport. Uh, there are three other lectures for general principles or, or the basic function of the cells and that will be done next week but for people who are watching the future that that's just the next lecture so yeah the lecture is finished um if you have anything in your mind that you think i could improve on my lecture or if you think that i made a mistake during the lecture hit me up in the comments and i will see them and i'll see where i can improve next time i'm open to criticism so don't think that I'm sensitive, be as hard as you can. And uh, if you have any questions regarding the lecture, you could hit me up or DM me um, in my Instagram page. Or if you know me personally, you could just reach out and message me. Um, so yeah, I hope you learned something and I hope this lecture was helpful. So yeah, thank you for sitting through this lecture if you came on to the end here. <laughs> as my favorite chemistry teacher used to say goodbye to us, this was his line, so yeah. See you when you see me.